Full disclosure, I didn't say my British accent was good, just that I can do one. So if it's horrible, by all means, feel free to change your minds and tell me to read it normally. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Stay one. Marley's Ghost. And again, please tell me if the music is louder than I am. Let me know and I will... Bahalo. Molly was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Molly was as dead as a doornail. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it, or the country's downfall. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral, and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. If we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking a stroll at night in an easterly wind upon his own ramparts than there would be in any other middle-aged gentleman rashly tuning out after dark in a breezy spot. Say, St. Paul's Churchyard, for instance, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head, and on his eyebrows and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he, no falling snow was more intent upon its purpose, no pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often came down handsomely, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the Mlyman's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an even eye, Dalkmaster. But what does Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. To edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, was what the knowing ones call nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy withal, 
and he could hear the people in the court outside go freezing, go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. It had not been night all day, and candles were flaring in the windows of the neighboring offices like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. To see the dingy clouds come drooping down, obscuring everything, one might have thought that nature lived hard by and was brewing on a large scale. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room. And so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of a strong imagination, he failed. <clears throat> a Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah, said Scrooge, humbug. He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, and his breath smoked again. Christmas a humbug, uncle, said Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I am sure. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, returned the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer ready on the spur of the moment, said bah again and folded up with humbug. Don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What else can I be, returned the uncle, when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas, out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older but not an hour richer? A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen of months presented dead against you? If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a steak of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, pleaded nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly. Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated Scrooge's nephew, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do to you. Much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time, when it has come round, apart from the veneration due to its sacred name and origin, if anything belonging to it can be apart from that, as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good, and I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Becoming immediately sensible of the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished the last frail spark forever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you will keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. 
But why? cried Scrooge's nephew. Why? Why did you get married? said Scrooge. Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love? growled Scrooge, as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I am sorry, with all my heart, to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party. But I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge, and a Happy New Year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. There's another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. My clerk, with fifteen shillings a week and a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. This lunatic, and letting Scrooge's nephew out, had led two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago this very night. We have no doubt this liberality is well represented by his surviving partner, said the gentleman, presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the union workhouses, demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid, from what you said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their usual course, said Scrooge. I'm very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman. A few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt, and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry Christmas. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it, and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labours with an improved opinion of himself, and in a more facetious temper than was usual with him. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became invisible 
and stop the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering and its frozen head up there. The cold became intense. In the main street at the corner of the court, some laborers were repairing the gas pipes and had lighted a great fire in a brazier round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowing suddenly congealed and turned to misanthropic ice. The brightness of the shops, where holy sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows, made pale faces ruddy as they passed. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant, with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as the Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret, while his lean wife and the baby sallied out to buy the beef. Foggier yet and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold. If the good St. Dunstan had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that, instead of using his familiar weapons, then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold, as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with the Christmas carol. But at the first sound of God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congenial frost. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. "'You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose,' said Scrooge. "'If quite convenient, sir.' "'It's not convenient,' said Scrooge, "'and it's not fair. "'If I was to stop half a crown for it, "'you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound.' "'The clerk smiled faintly. "'And yet,' said Scrooge, "'you don't think me ill-used "'when I pay a day's wages for no work.' "'The clerk observed that it was only once a year. "'A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December,' "'said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to the chin. "'But I suppose you must have the whole day. "'Be here all the earlier the next morning.' "'The clerk promised that he would, "'and Scrooge walked out with a growl. "'The office was closed and in a twinkling, "'and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter "'dangling below his waist, "'for he boasted no great coat, "'went down a slide on Cornhill "'at the end of a lane of boys, twenty times, "'in honour of it being Christmas Eve, "'and then went home to Camden Town "'as hard as he could pelt to play a blind man's buff.' Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms, and a lowering pile of building up a yard, where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house, playing at hide-and-seek with other houses and had forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now, and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all lit out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. The fog and frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of the weather sat in mournful meditation on the threshold. Give me one moment, I'm going to do something real quick. There we go. Now it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London, even including, which is a bold word, the corporation, alderman and livery. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of him seven years their partner that afternoon. 
and then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face. It was not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air, and on the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That, and its livid colour, made it horrible. But its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than at the parts of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled, or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation, to which it had been a stranger from infancy, would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. He did pause with the moment's irresolution before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. <coughs> so he said, Poo, poo, and closed it with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every arc cask in the wine cellars and merchants below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly too, trimming his candle as he went. You may talk vaguely about driving a coach and six up a good old flight of stairs, or through a bad young act of parliament, but I mean to say you might have got a hearse up that staircase and taken it broadwise with a splinter bar towards the wall and the door towards the balustrades and done it easy. There was plenty of wit for that and room to spare, which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive hearse going on before him in the gloom. Half a dozen gas lamps out of the street wouldn't have lighted the entry too well, so you may suppose that it was pretty dark with Scrooge's dip. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for that. Darkness is cheap and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. A small fire and the great spoon and basin ready, and the little saucepan of gruel. Scrooge had a cold in his head upon the hope. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room as usual, old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs and a poker. <coughs> Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in double locked himself in, which was not his costume. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers, and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed, nothing on such a bitter night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel. The fireplace was an old one built by some Dutch merchant long ago, and paved all round with quaint Dutch tiles designed to illustrate the scriptures. There were Cain's and Abel's, Pharaoh's daughters, queens of Sheba, angelic messengers descending through the air on clouds like feather beds, Abraham's, Belshazzar's, apostles putting off to sea in butter boats, hundreds of figures to attract his thoughts, and yet that face of Marley seven years dead, came like the ancient prophet's rod and swallowed up the whole. If each smooth tile had been a blank at first, with power to shape some picture on its surface from the disjointed fragments of his thoughts, there would have been a copy of old Marley's head on every one. Humbug, said Scrooge, and walked across the room. After several turns, he sat down again. As he threw his head back in the chair, 
his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room, and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with the chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute, or a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bells ceased as they had begun, together. They were succeeded by a clanking noise, deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar, Scooch then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still, said Scooge. I won't believe it. His colour changed, though, when, without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost, and fell again. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the tassels on the latter bristling like his pigtail, and his curled skirts and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail. And it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent so that Scrooge, observing him, and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked the panthom through and through, and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes, and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before, he was still incredulous and fought against his senses. His senses. How now? said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. What do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice. No doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? Said Scrooge, raising his voice. You're particular for a shade. He was going to say to a shade, but substituted this as more appropriate. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? Asked Scrooge, looking doubtful at him. I can. Do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in condition to take a chair and felt that in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me, observed the ghost. I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? Because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror, for the spectre's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones. To sit, staring at those fixed, glazed eyes, in silence for a moment, would play, Scrooge felt, the very deuce with him. There was something very awful, too, in the spectre's being provided with an infernal atmosphere of its own. Scrooge could not feel it himself, but this was clearly the case, for though the ghost sat perfectly motionless, its hair and skirts and tassels were still agitated as by the hot vapour from an oven. "'You see this toothpick?' said Scrooge, 
returning quickly to the charge, for the reason just assigned. In wishing, though it were only for a second, to divert the vision's stony gaze from itself. I do, replied the ghost. You are not looking at it, said Scrooge. But I see it, said the ghost, notwithstanding. Well, returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this, and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you, humbug. At this the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom taking off the bandage round its head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy! He said, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide and if that spirit goes not forth in life it is condemned to do so after death it is doomed to wander through the world oh woe is me and witness what it cannot share but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness again the spectre raised a cry and shook its chain and wrung its shadowy hands you are fettered, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Or would you know pursued the ghost the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself it was full as heavy and as long as this seven christmas eves ago you have labored on it since it is a ponderous chain scrooge glanced about him on the floor in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable but he could see nothing jacob he said imploringly. Oh, Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would. A very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In life, my spirit never rode beyond the narrow limits of our money changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. It was a habit with Scrooge, whenever he became thoughtful, to put his hands in his breeches pockets. Pondering on what the ghost had said, he did so now, but without lifting up his eyes or getting off his knees. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob, Scrooge observed in a business-like manner, though with humility and de- No peace, incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast, says Scrooge. On the wings of the wind, replied the ghost. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years, said Scrooge. The ghost, on hearing this, set up another cry and clanked its chain so hideously in the dead silence of the night that the ward would have been justified in indicting it for a nuisance. Oh, captive, bound, and double ironed, cried the phantom, not to know that ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. 
not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunities misused. Yet such was I, oh, such was I. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. It held up its chain at arm's length, as if that were the cause of all its unavailing grief, and flung it heavily upon the ground again. At this time of the rolling year, the spectre said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down, and never raised them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the spectre going on at this rate, and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, cried the ghost. My time is nearly done. I will, said Scrooge, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob, pray. How it is that I appear before you in a shape that you can see, I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. It was not an agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the perspiration from his brow. That is no light part of my penance, pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. You are always a good friend to me, said Scrooge. Thank you. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghost had done. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is. I, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visits, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Hinted Scrooge. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the spectre took its wrapper from the table and bound it round its head as before. Scrooge knew this by the smart sound its teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again, and found his supernatural visitor confronting him with an erect attitude, with his chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backwards from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped, not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, 
When linked together, none were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant, whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power for ever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell, but they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he had walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable, and being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible word, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant. Stave 2. The First of the Three Spirits When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavouring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes, when the chimes of a neighbouring church struck the four quarters, so he listened for the hour. To his great astonishment, the heavy bell went on from six to seven, and from seven to eight, and regularly up to twelve, then stopped. Twelve! It was past two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong. An icicle must have got in the works. Twelve! He touched the spring of his repeater to correct his most preposterous clock. Its rapid little pulse beat twelve and stopped. Why, it is impossible, said Scrooge, that I can have slept through a whole day and far to another night. It is impossible that anything had happened to the sun and this is twelve at noon. The idea being an alarming one, he scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. He was obliged to rub the frost off with the sleeve of his dressing gown before he could see anything and could see very little then. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold, and that there was no noise of people running to and fro and making a great stir, as there unquestionably would have been if night had beaten off bright day and taken possession of the world. This was a great relief, because three days after sight of his first of exchange paid to Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge or his order, and so forth, would have become a mere United States security if there were no days to count by. Scrooge went to bed again, and thought, and thought, and thought it over, and over, and over, and could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was, and the more he endeavoured not to think, the more he thought. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. Every time he resolved within himself, after mature inquiry, that it was all a dream, his mind flew back again, like a strong spring released to its first position, and presented the same problem to be worked all through. Was it a dream or not? Scrooge lay in a state until the chimes had gone three quarters more, when he remembered, on a sudden, that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell tolled one. He resolved to lie awake until the hour had passed, and considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven, this was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. The quarter was so long that he was more than once convinced he must have sunk into a doze unconsciously and missed the clock. At length, it broke upon his listening ear. Ding dong! A quarter past, said Scrooge, counting. Ding dong! Half past, said Scrooge. Ding dong! A quarter to it, said Scrooge. Ding dong! The owl itself, said Scrooge triumphantly, and nothing else. He spoke before the owl bell sounded, which it now did with a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand. Not the curtains at his feet, nor the curtains at his back, but those to which his face was addressed. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, starting up into a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. As close to it as I am now to you, and I am standing in the spirit at your elbow. 
It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through th some supernatural medium which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet, most delicately formed, were like those upper members, bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was, that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright clear jet of light, by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using in its duller moments a great extinguisher for a cap which it now held under its arm. Even this, though, when Scrooge looked at it with increasing steadiness, was not its strangest quality. For as its belt sparkled and glittered, now in one part and now in another, and what was light one instant at another time was dark, so the figure itself fluctuated in its distinctness, being now a thing with one arm, now with one leg, now with twenty legs, now a pair of legs without a head, now a head without a body, of which dissolving parts no outline would be visible in the dense gloom wherein they melted away. And in the very wonder of this it would be itself again, distinct and clear as ever. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? asked Scrooge. I am. The voice was soft and gentle, singularly low, as if instead of being so close beside him it were at a distance. Who and what are you? Scrooge demanded. I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? inquired Scrooge, observant of its dwarfish stature. No, your past. Perhaps Scrooge could not have told anybody why, if anybody could have asked him, but he had a special desire to see the spirit in his cap and begged him to be covered. What? exclaimed the ghost. Would you so soon put out, with worldly hands, the light I give? Is it not enough that you are one of those whose passions made this cap and forced me through whole trains of years to wear it low upon my brow? Scrooge reverently disclaimed all intention to offend, or any knowledge of having willfully bonneted the spirit at any period of his life. He then made bold to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare, said the ghost. Scrooge expressed himself much obliged, but could not help thinking that a night of unbroken rest would have been more conductive to that end. The spirit must have heard him thinking, for it said immediately, Your reclamation, then. Take heed. It put out its strong hand as it spoke and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes, that bed was warm and the thermometer a long way below freezing, that he was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown, and nightcap, and that he had a cold upon him at that time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made towards the window, clasped its road in supplication. I am a mortal, Scrooge remonstrated, and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon its heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road, with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished, not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold winter day, with snow upon the ground. Good heaven, said Scrooge clasping his hands together as he looked about him. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. The spirit gazed upon him mildly. Its gentle touch, though it had been light and instantaneous, appeared still present to the old man's sense of feeling. He was conscious of a thousand odors floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and cares long, long forgotten. Your lip is trembling, said the ghost. And what is that upon your cheek? Scrooge muttered, with an unusual catching in his voice, that it was a pimple. 
and begged the ghost to lead him where he would. "'You recollect the way?' inquired the spirit. "'Remember it!' cried Scrooge of fervor. "'I could walk it blindfold!' "'Strange to have forgotten it for so many years,' observed the ghost. "'Let us go on.' They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance, with its bridge, its church, and winding river. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs, who called to other boys in country gigs and carts, driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad fields were so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They have no consciousness of us. The jocund travellers came on, and as they came, Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why, he was rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them. Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas as they parted at crossroads and byways for their several homes? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas, what good had it ever done to him? This school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child neglected by his friends is left there still. Scrooge said he knew it, and he sobbed. They left the high road by a well-remembered lane and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick, with a little weathercock surmounted cupola on the roof and a bell hanging in it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes, for the spacious offices were little used, their walls were damp and mossy, their windows broken and their gates decayed. Fowls clucked and strutted in the stables, and the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. Nor was it more retentive of its ancient state within, for entering the dreary hall and glancing through the open doors of many rooms, they found them poorly furnished, cold and vast. There was an earthly savour in the air, a chilly barrenness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight and not too much to eat. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, across the hall, to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made bare still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire and Scrooge sat down upon a form and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he had used to be. Not a latent echo in the house, not a squeak and scuffle from the mice behind the panelling, not a drip from the half-thawed water spout in the dull yard behind, not a sigh among the leafless boughs of one despondent poplar, not the idle swinging of an empty storehouse door, no, not a clicking in the fire, but fell upon the heart of Scrooge with softening influence and gave a freer passage to his tears. The spirit touched his mother's arm and pointed to his younger self, intent upon his reading. Suddenly a man in foreign garments, wonderfully real and distinct to look at, stood outside the window with an axe stuck in his belt and leading an arse laden with wood by the bridle. Why, it's Ali Baba! Scrooge exclaimed in ecstasy. It's dear old honest Ali Baba. Yes, yes, I know. One Christmas time, when yonder solitary child was left here all alone, he did come for the first time, just like that. Poor boy. And Valentine, said Scrooge, and his wild brother Orson. There they go. And what's his name, who was put down in his jaws asleep at the gate of Damascus? Don't you see him? And the Sultan's groom turned upside down by the genie. There he is upon his head. Saw him right. I'm glad of it. What business had he to be married to the princess? To hear Scrooge expending all the earnestness of his nature on such subjects, in a most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying, and to see his heightened and excited face, would have been a surprise to his business friends in the city indeed. There's the parrot, cried Scrooge, green body and yellow tail, with a thing like a lettuce growing out the top of its head. There he is! Poor Robinson Crusoe, he called him, when he came home again after sailing round the island. Poor Robin Crusoe, where have you been, Robin Crusoe? The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. It was the parrot, you know. There goes Friday, running for his life to the little creek. Hello, Hope, hello. Then, with the rapidity of transition very foreign to his usual character, he said, 
in pity for his former self. Poor boy, and cried again. I wish, Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket and looking about him, after drying his eyes with his cuff. But it's too late now. What is the matter? asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge. Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something, that's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved his hand, saying as he did so, Let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked laths were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. He only knew that it was quite correct, that everything had happened so, that there he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost, and with a mournful shaking of his head, glanced anxiously towards the door. It opened, and the little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in, and putting her arms about his neck and often kissing him, addressed him as her dear, dear brother. "'I've come to bring you home, dear brother,' said the child, clapping her tiny hands and bending down to laugh. "'To bring you home, home, home.' "'Home, little fan,' returned the boy. "'Yes,' said the child, brimful of glee. "'Home for good and all. Come, for ever and ever.' Father is so much kinder than he used to be, that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home, and he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you, and you're to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes, and are never to come back here, but first, we're to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. You are quite a woman, little fan, exclaimed the boy. She clapped her hands and laughed and tried to touch his head, but being too little, laughed again and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him in her childish eagerness towards the door, and he, nothing loath to do, accompanied her. A terrible voice in the hall cried, Bring down Master Scrooge's box there! And in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with a ferocious condescension and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands with him. He then conveyed him and his sister into the veriest old well of a shivering best parlour that ever was seen, where the maps upon the wall and the celestial and terrestrial globes in the windows were waxy with cold. Here he produced a decanter of curiously lit wine and a block of curiously heavy cake and administered installments of those dainties to the young people. At the same time, sending out a meagre servant to offer a glass of something to the postboy, who answered that he thanked the gentleman, but if it was the same tap as he had tasted before, he'd rather not. Master Scrooge's trunk being by this time tied on the top of the chaise, the children bade the schoolmaster goodbye right willingly, and getting into it, drove gaily down the garden sweep, the quick wheels dashing the whole frost and snow from off the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray. Always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered, said the ghost, but she had a large heart. So she had, cried Scrooge. You're right. I'll not gainsay it, spirit, God forbid. She died like a woman, said the ghost, and had, as I think, children. One child, Scrooge returned. True, said the ghost. Your nephew. Scrooge seemed uneasy in his mind and answered briefly, Yes. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city, where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult of a real city were. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here too it was Christmas time again, but it was evening and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it, said Scrooge. Was I apprenticed here? They went in. At sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk, that if he had been two inches taller, he might have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried in great excitement. 
Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and carried out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice. Yo ho there, Ebenezer! Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow prentice. Dick Williams, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick? Poor Dick, dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig with a sharp clap of his hands. Before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three, had them up in their places. Four, five, six, barred them and pinned them. Seven, eight, nine, then came back before you could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hilly ho! cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick! Cheer up, Ebenezer! Clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away, or couldn't have cleared away, with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as it was dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lumps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with the music book, and went up to the lofty desk, and made an orchestra of it, and tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Ms. Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way, who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door, but one who was proved to have had her ears pulled by her mistress. In all they came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling, in they all came anyhow and every how. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, Hans half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old Top Couple was always turning up in the wrong place, new Top Couple starting off again. As soon as they got there, all Top Couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwick, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! and the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter especially provided for that purpose. But scorning rest upon his reappearance, he instantly began again, though there were no dancers yet, as if the other fiddler had been carried home exhausted on a shutter, and he were a brand new man resolved to beat him out of sight or perish. There were more dancers, and there were forfeits, and more dancers, and there was a cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler, an artful dog mind, the sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could have told it him, struck up Sir Roge de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig, top couple too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them, Three or four and twenty pair of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many, ah, four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. If that's not high praise, tell me higher, and I'll use it. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance, like moons. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, hold hands with your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, 
and back again to your place. Fezziwig cut, cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and come upon his feet again without a stagger. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the bag shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene and with his former self. He corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost and became conscious that it was looking full upon him, while the light upon its head burnt very clear. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices, who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig, and we had done so, said. Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money. Three or four, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is the matter? asked the ghost. Nothing particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think, the ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge. No, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. <coughs> His former self turned down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost again stood side by side in the open air. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick! This was not addressed to Scrooge or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect, for again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. His face had not the harsh or rigid lines of later years, but had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye, which showed the passion that had taken root, and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a morning dress, in whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said softly. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to time, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve you. What idol has displaced you? he rejoined. A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing in professors to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much, she answered gently. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your noble aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? What then, he retorted, even if I had grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. She shook her head. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until in good season we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy, he said impatiently. Your own feeling tells you that you are not what you are, she returned. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. 
How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words, no, never. In what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end, in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had ever had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly but with steadiness upon him. Tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? Ah, no. He seemed to yield to the justice of the supposition in spite of himself. But he said with a struggle, You think not. I would gladly think otherwise if I could, she answered. Heaven knows. When I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You, who in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain. Or choosing her, if for a moment... You were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so. Do I not know that your repentance and regret will surely follow? I do, and I release you, with a full heart, for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but with her head turned from him, she resumed. <clears throat> you may, the memory of what is past half makes me hope you will, have pain in this, a very, very brief time. And you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him and they parted. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more, exclaimed the ghost. No more, cried Scrooge. No more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place, a room, not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like the last that Scrooge believed it was the same, until he saw her, now a comely matron, sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count. And unlike the celebrated herd in the poem, there were not forty children counting themselves like one, but every child was conducting itself like forty. The consequences were uproarious beyond belief, but no one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much and the latter, soon beginning to mingle in the sports, got pillaged by the young brigands most ruthlessly. What would I not have given to be one of them? Though I never could have been so rude, no, no. I wouldn't for the wealth of all the world have crushed that braided hair and torn it down. And for the precious little shoe, I wouldn't have plucked it off, God bless my soul, to save my life. As to measuring her waist and sport, as they did, bold young brood, I couldn't have done it. I should have expected my aunt to have grown round it for a punishment and never come straight again. And yet I should have dearly liked, I own, to have touched her lips, to have questioned her, that she might have opened them, to have looked upon the lashes of her downcast eyes and never raised a blush, to have let loose waves of hair, an inch of which would be a keepsake beyond price. <clears throat> In short, I should have liked, I do confess, to have had the lightest license of a child's and yet been man enough to know its value. But now a knocking at the door was heard, and such a rush immediately ensued that she, with laughing face and plundered dress, was borne toward it in the centre of a flushed and boisterous group, just in time to greet the father, who came home attended by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents. Then the shouting and the struggling and the onslaught that was made on the defenceless porter the scaling him with chairs for ladders to dive into his pockets to despoil him of brown paper parcels, hold on tight by his cravat, hug him round the neck, pommel his back, and kick his legs in irrepressible affection. The shouts of wonder and delight with which the development of every package was received, the terrible announcement that the baby had been taking in the act of putting a doll's frying pan into his mouth, and was more than suspected of having swallowed a fictitious turkey, glued in a wooden platter. 
the immense relief of finding this a false alarm, the joy and gratitude and ecstasy, they were all indescribable alike. It is enough that by degrees the children and their emotions got out of the parlour and by one stair at a time up to the top of the house where they went to bed and so subsided. <clears throat> and now Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever when the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. And when he thought that such another creature, quite as graceful and as full of promise, might have called him father, and been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life, his sight grew very dim indeed. Bell, said the husband, turning to his wife with a smile, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. How can I? Tut, don't I know? She added in the same breath, laughing as she laughed. Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up, and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death, I hear, and there he sat alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, said Scrooge in a broken voice, remove me from this place. I told you these were shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. That they are what they are, do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed, I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost, and seeing that it looked upon him with a face, in which in some strange way there were fragments of all the faces that had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me! Take me back! Haunt me no longer! In the struggle, if that could be called a struggle, in which the ghost with no visible resistance on its own part was undisturbed by any effort of its adversary, Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright, and dimly connecting that with its influence over him. He seized the extinguisher cap, and by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it, so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. But though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light, which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed, and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Stave three. The second of the three spirits. Now waking in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore, and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time for the especial purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger dispatched to him with Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new spectre would draw back, he put them every one aside with his own hands and lying down again established a sharp lookout all round the bed. For he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance, and did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. Gentlemen of the free and easy sort, who plume themselves on being acquainted with a move or two, and being usually equal to the time of day, express the wide range of their capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter, between which opposite extremes, no doubt, there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects. Without venturing for Scrooge quite as hardly as this, I don't mind calling on to you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances, and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently, when the bell struck one, and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All this time he lay upon his bed, the very core and centre of a blaze of ruddy light, which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, and which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant or would be at and was sometimes apprehensive that he might be at that very moment an interesting case 
or spontaneous combustion, without having the consolation of knowing it. At last, however, he began to think, as you or I would have thought at first, for it is always the person not in the predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it, and would unquestionably have done it too. At last, I say, he began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room, from whence, on further tracing it, it seemed to shine. This idea taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room. There was no doubt about that but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light, as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry. Or Marley's. Or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped up upon the floor to form a kind of throne. Were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings. This is making me so hungry. <laughs> oh my god. Sorry, I'm just like imagining this pile of food. <clears throat> Barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelve cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. My entire mouth just filled with saliva. In easy state upon his couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch and shaped not unlike Plenty's horn. <coughs> and held it up, high up, <clears throat> to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping through the door. "'Come in!' exclaimed the ghost. "'Come in and know me better, man!' Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and though his eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. "'I am the ghost of Christmas present,' said the spirit. "'Look upon me!' Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple deep green robe or mantle bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious breast was bare, as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a holly wreath set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. "'You have never seen the like of me before!' exclaimed the spirit. "'Never!' Scrooge made answer to it have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young, my elder brothers born in these later years, pursued the phantom. I don't think I have, said Scrooge. I am afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit said Scrooge submissively. Conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters... Pies, puddings, fruit, and punch all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning, where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music, in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings, and from the tops of their houses. <coughs> 
whence it was a mad delight to the boys to see it come plumping down into the road below and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough, and the windows blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs, and with the dirtier snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been ploughed up in deep furrows by the heavy heels of carts and wagons. Furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times where the great streets branched off, and made intricate channels, hard to trace, in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the shorter streets were choked up with a dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had, by one consent, caught fire, and were blazing away to the dear heart's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate of the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad that the clearer summer air and brighter summer sun might have endeavoured to diffuse in vain. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets, and now and then exchanging a facetious snowball, better natured missile fowl than many a worldly jest, laughing heartily if it went right, and not less heartily if it went wrong. The poulterers' shops were still half open, and the fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great round pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts, shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the streets in their apoplectic opulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girthed Spanish onions shining in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars and winking from the shells in wanton slyness at the girls that they went by and glanced demurely at their hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes, made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings ankle-deep through withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squab and swarthy, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons, and in the great compactness of the juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very gold and silver fish set forth among these choice fruits in a bowl, though members of a dull and stagnant-blooded race appeared to know that there was something going on, and to a fish went grasping round and round the little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers, oh, the grocers nearly closed, with perhaps two shutters down, or one, but through those gaps such glimpses. It was not alone that the scales ascending on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly, highly decorated boxes, or that everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress, but the customers were all so hurried and so eager in the hopeful promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door, clashing their wicker baskets wildly, and left their purchases upon the counter and came running back to fetch them and committed hundreds of the like mistakes in the best humour possible, while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the polished hearts with which they fastened their aprons behind might have been their own one outside for general inspection, and for Christmas doors to peck it as if they chose. But soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their gayest faces, and at the same time there emerged from the scores of by-streets, lanes, and nameless turnings innumerable people, carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge behind him in a baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on their dinners from his torch. <laughs> what, did my internet cut out again? That was a very belated live message. <clears throat> and it was a very uncommon kind of torch for once or twice when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other. He shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humour was restored directly. 
for they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day. And so it was. God love it, so it was. In time the bell ceased, and the progress of their cooking, and the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven, where the pavement smoked as if its stones were cooking too. Is there a peculiar flavor in what you sprinkle from your torch? asked Scrooge. There is, my own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? asked Scrooge. To any kindly given, to a poor one most. Why to a poor one most? asked Scrooge. Because it needs it most. Spirit, said Scrooge after a moment's thought. I wonder you, all the beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I, cried the spirit, you would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often the only day in which they can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge, wouldn't you? I, cried the spirit, you seek to close these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge, and it comes to the same thing. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I'm wrong. It had been done in your name, or at least in that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of ours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us, and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, who are estranged to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that and charge their doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge promised that he would, and they went on, invisible, as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost which Scrooge observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath the low roof quite as gracefully, and like a supernatural creature, as it was possible he could have done in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men, that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks, for there he went, and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe. And on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with a splinkling of his torch. Think of that! Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays, but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly, in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap, and make a goodly show of for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Crouch had plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honour of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose, and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan then to be let out and peeled. "'What has ever got your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'And your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha weren't as late as last Christmas day by half an hour?' "'Here's Martha, mother,' said a girl, appearing as she spoke. "'Here's Martha, mother,' cried the two young Cratchits. "'Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha!' "'Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are!' said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times, and taking off her shawl and bonnet. For her with the fish's seal. We'd a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless you. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes donned up and brushed to look seasonable. 
and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to seem disappointed if it were only in joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit, when she had rallied Bob on his credulity and Bob has hugged a daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped that people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire, and while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if poor fellow they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratches went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon, <clears throat> to which a black swan was a matter of course. <clears throat> and in truth, it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, readily beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they could shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did... And when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board. And even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, oops, I pressed the wrong thing, sorry. Excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet every one had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose. A supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry's cook next door to each other. With the laundress next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly. With the pudding like a speckled cannonball so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stock on the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. 
Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been flat heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done. The cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, the fire made up. The compound and jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovelful of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew around the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two, meaning half a one. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers, and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as the golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us every one, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge with an interest he had never felt before, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in a poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh no, kind spirits say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent down before the ghost's rebuke, and trembling cast his eyes upon the ground. But he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Scratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be a Christmas Day, I'm sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer. Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit, not for his. Long life to him. A merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tink drank it last of all, but he didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for four or five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before from the mere relief of Scrooge, the baleful, being done with. I'm going to finish this paragraph and then I'm going to have to stop because I have to go to the kitchen. But I will finish this tomorrow. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five and six pence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favour when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. 
Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home. Also how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child travelling in the snow, from Tiny Tim who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. We'll pick up where we left off tomorrow. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope my accent wasn't too terrible. <laughs>